Hello and uh, welcome to today's SustainNet uh, webinar uh, and it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome a colleague from the Geography and Geology Department uh, today, a new colleague of mine, uh, Dr Ayushman Bagat, um, who is uh, a, a, a young researcher in uh, migration and trafficking, uh, undertook his PhD uh, at the University of Durham uh, in the UK and then took up a postdoc in Tel Aviv uh, before returning to a uh, full-time permanent lectureship uh, at Edge Hill. Uh, and Ayushman is going to be talking about uh, escaping trafficking borders, reflections from a participatory action research. Thanks very much, Ayushman. Thank you so much, Paul, for the introduction. Um, it's really a great pleasure to be able to talk about my research. Um, today I'll be talking about three things. Uh, first, I'll be trying to problematize the whole notion of human trafficking. Uh, second, I'll talk about how people uh, escape uh, the notion of human trafficking. From, like, I mean, I'll be using quite a lot of empirical examples. And third, uh, uh, to connect that, to make sense of that, I'll talk about my PhD research, uh, the participatory action research that I took that I that, that I conducted uh, in Nepal, a remote location. Um, so, in this particular in this particular talk, first I'll introduce you to the notion of human trafficking. I'll talk about how this particular uh, debate is very old. Uh, it's like over the last hundred years, people are talking about human trafficking related issues, and then I'll talk about participatory action research. Uh, but uh, so this is something which is very important because I will not talk about, uh, you know, how amazing this research is, which is very, very interesting form of research. I'll be talking about how I try to, uh, in, uh, how, like, you know, bring um, the notion of failure in my uh, uh, research. Uh, and then I'll talk about uh, geographies of borders. Uh, where anti-trafficking interventions are uh, encountered, experienced, and escaped uh, in Nepal. So this is something which is very interesting because majority of the work, uh, majority of the empirical work, I would say, which is like we very less, uh, talks about political spaces where you know human trafficking uh, is uh, felt uh, by people. Human trafficking uh, is encountered as borders. However, I'll extend this particular discussion and talk about uh, the social spaces where human trafficking uh, is encountered as fodder. Uh, Anti-trafficking interventions are encountered as fodder. And then I'll talk about uh, something which I'm planning to write at this particular moment, uh, geographies of escape, how people uh, escape uh, human trafficking uh, borders. Uh, and on the basis of that, uh, I will try to conceptualize uh, trafficking borders and escape mobilities. Um, and, and, and and once I you know start, talk about the conceptualization, you will see that it actually feeds into a broader research agenda of what I call as destination bias in majority of the critical uh, literature. So let's get started. So as you know that human trafficking is one of the most politically charged cash phase of the 21st century. Uh, every time this particular uh, word is invoked, people do not think rationally. People, uh, people just, I mean, the emotional appeal of this particular terminology is so high that uh, people do not uh, think about, you know, I mean, how this particular discourse could be highly problematic, uh, despite uh, well-established critical literature which is out there. So it started from uh, something which historians understand as white slave trade. It was happening in uh, the early uh, 21st century or like around 1900s and all, where there was this panic. There was this moral panic that women from the UK uh, is being trafficked uh, towards other location and uh, people are dumping women in, uh, you know, like territories of UK and, you know, like Western Europe and all. Uh, this is this this some this is something which is very important in human geography, especially some political geographers call it as a purification of space, as an attempt to purify certain space. Um, you know, at that particular time, there was uh, industrial revolution that was happening, and majority of the uh, you know like people from uh, Eastern Europe were migrating towards Western Europe, and people uh, started being you know uh, you know there was this like 
mass campaign against uh, white slave trade, white slave traffic uh, in the UK, and it slowly spread across the entire uh, world. Um, but uh, some critical historians consider this particular uh, you know, discourse uh, that was happening at, you know, at those times as a very racist agenda, which was also a very conservative agenda as well. Recently, Mar uh, Atwood has present, like, uh, published quite a lot of research articles which suggest that uh, the, you know, uh, the trafficking is, at that particular time, it was a coveted form of anti-Semitism as well, because it was targeted towards Jews. Uh, not only people, people know that you know, uh, trafficking uh, is basically creates a binary between us and them, and them were those people who do not belong to this particular, you know, uh, in one particular space. Now, over the period of time, people stopped talking about human trafficking because World War happened, and uh, the debate of human trafficking was not very high. Uh, but uh, after 1975, it slowly started picking up. Uh, so many things happened. Uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina happened at that time. You know, people from Africa meltdown because of uh, uh, structural adjustment programs. Uh, and, and, and like in 90s, we saw uh, yeah, USSR fall down. And because of all these global uh, uh, events uh, of geopolitical significance, migration started. Uh, my uh, people, people started. Uh, panicking again about human trafficking and guess what the debate is exactly the same there are men who traffic women and we do need to save women from sex work however uh, the, while the term is very old 100 years old uh, the, there was no uh, particular consensus around uh, what exactly human trafficking is and that uh, in the 90s we saw that uh, world divided into two uh, groups, um, um, uh, and these were feminist groups. And one particular group was saying that trafficking is something which is extremely bad, and we do need to stop talking about it. But then other people, uh, and, and, and in order to save women, we do need to abolish sex work. Uh, and over the period of time, you know, it became Nordic model and all. Uh, but then other group of people were saying that, okay, sexual exploitation do happen uh, in literally all labor relations, why you are exclusively targeting uh, sex work. So there was this internal debate that happened, and there are so many people who say that, especially critical scholars say that, you know, most of the anti-trafficking intervention, uh, which is directed towards sex work and sex worker creates something which is called as collateral damage. And they focus on rights and representation of sex work because this is something which is extremely marginalized in the contemporary debate. But in 2000, uh, in order to solve this debate, United Nations came up with first definition of uh, legal definition of human trafficking, as you can see here. Uh, the act, uh, basically, it's a big definition, but it talks uh, about three things, act, means, and purpose. Uh, and it's a very, very broad definition, and majority of the critical scholars are not happy about it. They say that this is a historical compromise, which feeds into uh, the agenda of those feminists who uh, who want to stop sex work. They think that in order to stop sex, in order to stop trafficking, we do need to stop sex work. Uh, so, so people are not happy about it. But in the same year, in 2000, uh, U.S. also passed this domestic law, uh, which is called as Trafficking Victim Protection Act. And under that act, uh, it divides country into three categories, uh, three tiers, basically. Uh, so countries who are not able to, uh, you know, fulfill the, the, the uh, or let's say you are, they are not able to meet the criteria of uh, protecting or you know like combating human trafficking on the basis of the definition which was set up by the US uh, they were placed in tier three those people who were trying those countries who were trying they're placed as tier two and those people who are who were fully uh, meeting the criteria of the US they were placed at tier one so this is this is important to understand here because uh, US threatens uh, other countries uh, with financial um, sanctions. So U.S. became something which is called a global sheriff, uh, you know, to combat human trafficking. Uh, but uh, there were other organizations uh, who were equally interested in, uh, you know, combating uh, labor uh, exploitation and all. And one of the primary, uh, one of the most important organizations was International Labor Organization, which has its own understanding of forced labor. And they say they used to say that forced labor uh, trafficking is part of forced labor. 
uh, uh, another United Nations organization, uh, which is UNODC, uh, Organization of Drug and Crime, they say that uh, tra forced labor is uh, trafficking is not part of forced labor. Uh, forced labor is part of trafficking. So again, you can see the internal contradictions among quite a lot of like big organ multilateral bilateral organizations, uh, and and they were equally invested in something. So so in 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 some total, we see that most of the people are interested in exploitation of women, uh, ex labor exploitation of men as well. Over the period of time, you know, it moves from men uh, women to men. Uh, but they have their own understanding of how to define this particular thing and how to combat it. Now, at this particular moment, everything is being subsumed under the agenda of modern slavery, uh, which United Kingdom is leading, because there is no such act uh, of modern slavery in most of the countries. Only US, only the UK and Australia has passed modern slavery uh, act. However, in majority of the countries, uh, there are uh, human trafficking related act and all. Now, over the period of time, uh, many uh, scholars from different disciplines, they started commenting on, you know, uh, the whole agenda of trafficking. And there are so many different approaches. I mean, the major approach, which, uh, of course, this definition of U uh, UN in Dross is uh, right, criminal uh, justice approach. They think that, you know, it's very important to prosecute uh, traffickers. It's very important to like free women from, you know, sexual slavery and all. Uh, however, other on, on the other side, there are like quite a lot of critical approaches, like rights-based approach, labor-based approach, which talks about uh, labor trafficking, which uh, Professor Hilashami uh, is leading in Tel Aviv, uh, and then development approach, which Professor Prabhakoti Swaran talks about. Um, so there are so many alternative approach. Uh, but uh, they all talk about quite a lot of issues related to human trafficking. One is, of course, historical, uh, you know, um, generated binaries, which which is very, very problematic. Julia O'Connor Davidson says that uh, the moment you decide who is victim and who is not, you are actually, uh, you know, doing a very, very political, you are making a very uh, politically charged, uh, um, uh, you know, decision, which creates binary among trafficking victims and non-trafficking victims, but uh, sometimes non-trafficking victims are more exploited than trafficking victims. So these these feeds into uh, ambitious defi uh, def ambiguous definitions, which uh, uh, Jenny Chuang talk about, and then they say that majority of the trafficking research are shoddy because it's very hard to distinguish between, uh, you know, uh, trafficking victims, uh, those people who will be trafficking victims uh, and those who are vulnerable to human trafficking. Tindam says that we should focus on those people who are legally uh, labeled as trafficking victim. But I argue that there is no way you can uh, distinguish between uh, those people who are legally, uh, you know, uh, labeled as human trafficking and those people who are exploited, those people who are in the situation of tra trafficking, those people who are vulnerable to human trafficking. Now, fame world and uh, so many contemporary scholars suggest that majority of the numbers that we hear about human trafficking is fake. Uh, it's basically extrapolated numbers that we, uh, we see. And what happens is, you know, uh, I mean, I would use Foucault's understanding of biopower here that the statistics actually legitimizes the discussion of human trafficking, the dominant paradigm of human trafficking. Now, there are other scholars who say that uh, the representations uh, that we see in media, uh, you know, the woman, we will see hand like cuffed uh, and we'll see, you know, like a branded branding of women. It, 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 it is quite problematic, ethically problematic and all. Uh, but uh, and, and then there are people who would say, especially migration scholars like uh, Bridget Anderson and Martin Rose, they say that it, uh, it, 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 it feeds directly into oppressive immigration regime. I'll give you one example. So for, uh, uh, if one person is identified as trafficking victim, here, uh, the person will be sent to a national referral mechanism of the UK, and then decision takes place uh, whether the person should be uh, assigned the label of victim or not. Now, if the person is not assigned label of victim, all of a sudden, person become illegal immigrant, and now the state like you know deports them, and even if they are assigned as victim of trafficking, states or like deports them as well. So uh, at the end of the day, the discourse of trafficking mobilizes the immigration rich like discourse, and it, it actually uh, gives 
uh, boosts you know all those uh, detention and deportation uh, you know techniques which which is which is normally done by uh, so uh, destination countries um, and uh, there are uh, you know um, like feminists from the global south especially uh, uh, the organization from uh, uh, GAPW which is the general alliance of trafficking against women they say that you know the politics of rescue is bad there are people like McGrath and Watson who says that you know it basically feeds directly into the politics of development because most of the anti-trafficking interventions are led by development-based organizations in the global south and people do not talk much about it uh, and then of course there are people who problematize quite a lot of uh, you know anti-trafficking interventions like awareness generation and all now what i believe that most of these uh, just critical discussions are very important however there is an issue with all of them you know they have not looked deeply into social spaces how trafficking discourse manifests in social spaces and this is something which uh, i i am trying to problematize and one example of it would be the example of nepal where sex work uh, is not a lot people are not allowed to leave for sex work uh women mobility to domestic work uh, in middle east is banned and uh the state uh, through its directive bans uh, migration of women to middle east for domestic work and most of the anti trafficking organization they have uh, brought this particular you know uh, uh, legal stat, uh, directive and they 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 actually uh, protect women from being trafficked uh, in middle east uh but the problem here is majority of the employers in middle east and the kapara system they are able to issue visa directly to the women because of uh, you know um, there is something which is called as kapala system which is a sponsor based immigration uh, in the middle east and majority of the employers they need domestic workers especially in the middle east and spaces so what they do is they directly issue visa now it really doesn't matter whether uh, you know women are a lord Uh, or not in nepal majority of the women directly receive visa so they move to india or maybe they'll go to sri lanka they will take the visa they i mean because of the open india and uh, nepal border it's very easier for them to move to india and forge their visa and they illegally enter into middle east in spaces so the temporality of illegal illegality is basically from the place where they start move, moving from their household to the immigration regime so clearly something different is happening which majority of the critical scholars are not able to perceive one uh, that um, you know for critical scholars immigration regime is a bad bad regime right which excludes women here immigration regime wants women because it feeds directly into the labor uh, you know workforce uh, and people are entering into immigration regime legally however uh emigration regime uh the weaker states like let's say quote and unquote weaker states like nepal they do not allow uh, women to move they they are protecting their they are like restricting their own citizens in the name of protection so something uh, uh, very different is happening here and the existing understanding of both critical migration study critical border study and critical anti trafficking studies uh and have not prepared uh, like adequately looked into the this this particular fact because um, there are some literature which talks about uh, this these um, you know problematic uh, state immigration state policies but i mean it has not been widely critiqued now during the disaster that happened in nepal in 2015 uh, the mobility increased a lot and 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 and, and with the mobility increase quite a lot of ngos have received a lot of funds to combat human trafficking now i wanted to look into that uh, but i feel that i mean i mean and i have looked into that but uh, i feel uh, after reviewing all this literature and all there is something which i call as destination bias which is there uh, in you know the critical literature most of uh, most of the critical literature are focused are focusing too much on the labor regimes Uh, uh in the immigrant like in the immigration regime you know in in labor relations their whole focus is marxist scholar talk about you know what happens in the labor uh, regime you know exploitation and everything or critical border critical scholars problematize immigration regime and majority of the work is basically eurocentric uh but i think that we really need to work on this particular bias in order to capture more 
uh, stories like that in order to you know like uh, fight for the rights of uh, migrant workers uh, now uh, in, in order to address this destination bias i did a participatory action research in a location which is called as hotspot of human trafficking now my association uh, with uh, this debate of human trafficking is very long uh, initially i used to work as a development professional and work with the community and then over the period of time i worked with the un implementing a project related to labor trafficking but then i always found it problematic because people were not ready to listen to the voices of the community those people who were considered as target of both trafficking and anti trafficking their voices were not there so i thought i should create a project which 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 which, which actually brings their voice to the fore but the problem here was where to start from so what i did was i went to nepal without any preparation of course i you know created a, a framework uh, in order to pass my um, uh, ethical review and ethical exam uh, uh, in in durham but then over the period of time you know that changed and i've already like told to the ethical board that whenever uh, you know things will change i will write another application so that required me to write ethical you know to, to receive ethical clearance at least 3 to 4 times uh but the moment i entered into nepal uh, i thought that i should start things from scratch so i uh, started uh, engaging with um, different communities uh different ngos basically uh in, who were working in kathmandu on anti trafficking related issues and i created a database uh, of like various ngos government organizations trade unions and you know like there were so many networks of uh, uh, anti trafficking networks were there in nepal so i created a database and then i started interviewing people so initially i was doing uh, you know interviewing people in kathmandu and then over the period of time i moved, started moving uh, into you know like uh, different districts uh, different villages of nepal to understand where i should be doing this research so as you can see in this particular uh, diagram now uh, there is basically uh, uh, uh this is the, this is china border uh, and you know this is basically the himalayan uh, terrain now uh, majority of the ngos whom i was talking they were uh, asking me to go to this particular site these these areas and they said that these areas are traffic prone areas so uh, so what i did was i collated all of their information i asked quite a lot of questions to these ngos Uh, and then i collated all information and then i went to one of the villages at that time it was really an accessible extremely remote uh, and and then i asked uh, the community whether they would like me to do research on traffic and all so before entering into that particular research majority of the ngos told me that you are not supposed to talk of talk about human trafficking related issues in community because if you do that chances are very high that community might not accept you and kick you out from that particular place so i changed uh, research uh, you know the, the the beginning point of the research and i was like trafficking is just a political category you know and i should be researching on mobility to see what comes up so my question to the community was around mobility and migration and all the community said that no this is a problem and this is a historical problem and over the period of time you will uh, learn about it more so what i did was you know i did this a scoping study then i again went back to dharam wrote another ethical clearance and risk assessment and then again went to the uh, went to that particular community directly this time i didn't stop in kathmandu and all and directly entered into that community and the first thing that i saw in the community was the community was highly divided on the basis of politics that was happening at that time uh, because i think it's because of the uh, elections that were due and people told me that look if you want to do a research here you have to bring community together so what i did was i tried to uh, you know bring the community member together and they told me that okay there is good research you would be interested in that but uh, you have to make a committee first to begin with so community uh, community members they choose their own community uh, committee uh, you know there was a president and you know vice president and all and then uh, on the uh, through that particular community and of course other people in the village i selected five different people who were representative of five different subject positions one was like sex worker the other one was 
uh, those people. And the person was never migrated. Other person, those people. Other person was the person who went to Middle East for domestic work, uh, and some uh, some some were like women leader, and two of them were men as well. So um, so when we uh, you, uh, like, create, like when we selected peer researchers. Uh, we uh, negotiated for a safe space where we can sit together and act and reflect. So one of the most important bit of participatory action research is, uh, you know, action and reflection, where you act and then you reflect. Immediately you reflect with the community member to try to understand what what action you would do next. So we met in that particular space for several times uh, and there. Uh, Things changed a lot of like they changed the research question, they changed you know uh, interview criteria and all. So the first time when they went out, they came back uh, and then we discussed. They told me that look, we do need to create a focus group, right? So they created a focus group and then we started focus group discussion first. We were not even interviewing community at that time. Uh, we were going to different habitations in that mountain uh, in, in that village. And we were, uh, you know, trying to understand, you know, what was the problem and all this sort of stuff. Now, over the period of time, we started selecting people to interview. Now, what happened was a lot of uh, people told me uh, that uh, there is no point in interviewing one subject category. For example, we started with interviewing sex workers. You know, I mean, this is the first thing that people do in anti-trafficking research. So um, they interview sex workers. They interview those people who were labeled as uh, traffic victims. Uh, but then when we came to back and when we analyzed the data, we realized that, you know, uh, there is more to the debate and we do need to broaden our criteria. So then we uh, interviewed those people who have been illegal uh, in Middle East. Uh, and then we interviewed those people who have been illegal in Malaysia. Uh, then people say that why you are uh, focusing only on women, you should focus on men as well. So those people who you know, um, became, uh, you know, like very exploited uh, in, in the labor relations, uh, especially when we interviewed them as well. So, I mean, uh, by the end of the, you know, the whole uh, action and reflection thing, we realized that it's, you know, we have, we have collected a lot of data about literally every, like, you know, possible form of my forms of migration that was happening and from that particular village and you'll be surprised to you know that like a village was like what 100 200 people uh, 100 200 households were there but people used to migrate in like 30 different countries all over the world so that was something which was very important and then through the discussion we realized that uh, there are so many different migration routes that people are taking and we, we we started having discussion on what to do in order to solve the problem of exploitation and all. So initially, the whole idea was uh, formation of information center because participatory action research is organized around certain form of impact. However, people say that no, we are not supposed to do that. Uh, we can go and we'll think about it. So uh, I'll come to this particular discussion because this is something which is very, very interesting. And then I left from that village and then I went on to do this border ethnography. So what I did was I started, I took one particular route where people, uh, you know, expressed their encounter in, uh, with anti-trafficking organizations. And uh, then I like traced the route, uh, did a microethnography, border ethnography on those places where people uh, those both social and political places, uh, spaces where people encounter anti-trafficking NGOs and organizations, uh, and, uh, and 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 then I'm, then I went on to do this like you know uh, airport ethnography as well. So initially, you know, my uh, whole route was uh, national highways, four Indo-Nepal bordering locations. And people use these bottling locations for different purposes. I'll get back to that as well. And once I did that, I went on to uh, do this one route uh, from uh, starting from village and then Kathmandu Airport. Then I went to Delhi, where people go and vanish. Uh, then it vanished because it's a refuge, Tibetan refugee colony, and the research was conducted happening with Tamang community. So uh, they used to prefer this particular site. And then I went to you know Delhi Airport, and then I went to Colombo Airport to try to understand how people come here, you know, to get different perspectives. And then I went to Kuwait Airport, and then I stopped my uh, field work and then came back. So some of the things that I uh, encounter 
uh, while I was doing the speed work was uh, internal detention and deportation. So you, when uh, women cross Indo-Nepal border, which is open for everyone, it's basically their right to move to you know uh, Indian territory. But there were like six to eight anti-trafficking organizations. In some places, there were eight anti-trafficking organizations, and women have to go through literally all eight. They have to satisfy uh, the doubts of anti-trafficking organizations that they are not going to work illegally. Uh, and if they are not able to satisfy you know, the questions of anti-trafficking organizations, they are deported, detained in these spaces. And from there, they are deported back to their communities. Now, this is something which is extremely important because this challenges the notion of detention and deportation. Majority of the time that when we talk about detention and deportation, we are talking about uh, those things happening in the uh, uh, global north, let's say. Uh, what are, and, and people present state as a very, very like sovereign, very like uh, monstrous entity. However, this is happening in Nepal uh, for the, uh, and the Nepal government is doing this. Uh, and NGOs are doing this for uh, to their own citizens. Now here the understanding of detention is state does it because it's a very very racially charged immigration regime for uh, you know towards people who are no, who do not belong to that particular one particular nation state. However, Nepal is doing it to their own citizens in the name of protection. Um, so this is the research ethics. I'll not get too much deep into it because. Uh, Participatory uh, research ethics is much more broader and much more stronger framework than any other research ethics. Know that uh, there were like two forms of research ethics. In uh, if I want to summarize it, uh, there are two forms of research ethics was practiced during the fieldwork. One was, of course, university you know, prescribed research ethics like anonymity, informed consent, confidentiality, and all. But the other form was ethics of encounter, and that particular time. You have no idea how to react. Uh, and then there were encounters that happens all the time if you live in the community. And then uh, there is a massive responsibility among, uh, on the researcher to be ethical. So I have to, like, you know, form care. And, you know, they were like, we were talking about collective actions. And of course, uh, social representation and responsibility uh, and accountability was also there. So the whole field work took uh, 7.5 months. Scoping study one, will immersion three months. I was regularly was in the community, and then well, I took one month to trace all the locations where people encounter owners. Now, uh, on the basis of that, I collected 48 mo stories of mobility, and uh, I reached out to more than you know 150 people in the community, and there were like so many hundreds of people I met during uh, the you know on the move research when I was doing border ethnography. Um, and then I came back uh, to Durham with all these data and tried to analyze these data by, you know, first putting it in an uh, Excel sheet and then try to understand how to, uh, you know, like make sense of this massive amount of data that was produced during uh, my field work. And over the period of time, I started making relationship and I saw so many things happening uh, in the uh, dissertation uh, in, in the in the in the in the field which 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 was not talked about uh, uh, as an especially critical anti-trafficking literature or critical border literature uh, were yet to unpack these uh, you know important findings that were coming from my research uh, uh, but one thing which was important and which i didn't shy to like remove from my uh, dissertation was the notion of failure now this is something which 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 is problem which is a problem with most of the research because what they do is they try to remove all these failure and all uh, because these are considered as mess but what I did was I like took those mess on board and try to understand what it means where this particular like massive amount of messy uh, data that you know that uh, let's say you know, empirical findings that was generated. Uh, rather than discarding them, I try to make, I try to start making sense out of them, you know. Uh, and it actually was, they were pushing me towards certain direction. For example, the five in the very first meeting that I described just now, people told me that everybody knows everything, but nobody's going to tell you anything. So, uh, and, and that came as a shock. But when I was leaving, people told me the chances are very high that people might fool you. 
because the kind of data that you are generated could be a performance. And I was like, hmm, this is a truth with all these research. Uh, but I mean, there were so many kinds of data that was there. And I was trying to understand that where people have fooled me because I mean, of course, you know, people were, when you are living in the community, you get so many different narratives from so many different people. So that was really, really helpful to see which, uh, at what point I was challenged by the community. So it's an inverse power relation that's happening. And that's also a very, very much important methodological finding because whenever we talk about positionality, we talk about positionality from our perspective and we try to neutralize the power relation. And then we assume that community has less power than you. Now here, uh, the data was suggesting that community was owning the power because I had no idea what kind of power relation I was placed in by the community. Now, the second thing which I talked about that uh, people people said no to the information uh, resource center, and that was something which was very important as well, because in a way they were trying to resist the production of border. If I would have created information resource center and I would have mobilized it, uh, people uh, that would bring the community into the light, especially uh, all anti-trafficking organization would, uh, would, would, would be easily, uh, they, they, I mean, it, it, it would be like, I mean, so my information resource center is something which is a big anti-trafficking intervention at this particular time, but people really don't know how to create a sustainable information resource center. However, community thought that this would become a border if uh, if I present something like this, if I do something like this, uh, it, it it would actually create more damage because majority of the women from that particular community moved to Middle East through a legal channel. So so I thought that you know that's basically we should anonymize the community as well. So we anonymized the entire uh, you know research community where I did my research, uh, and that that suggests that this community was trying to subvert the border that. Uh, that was produced uh, that could have been produced uh, due to my uh, uh, you know intervention and this is something which is which not only feeds to literature of participatory action research which valorizes the notion of impact this also talks about uh, various soft anti-trafficking interventions which are considered as you know like important like giving information to the community and all those other things now, now this this failure led me to understand trafficking uh, as borders, right? So when I try to understand where of anti-trafficking interventions, I realized that majority of the places uh, where uh, anti-trafficking uh, NGOs were trying to implement their projects, it was for community. It was nothing but borders, right? Now, in order to understand that, we uh, we need to understand the history of that particular place. Now, it's a very, very important and interesting history that was coming out of that small Himalayan location. So people think that, you know, women from that particular community are pretty. And over the, uh, like, two to 200 years ago, people used to send their daughters to, you know, uh, to, to the royal courtyards of Nepal. You know, majority of the uh, women from that particular community used to work as concubines, domestic work, and all. However, when that, you know, the whole royal thing stopped, people started moving to sex work because they say that all royals of Nepal, when they were like, uh, you know, moving to India uh, because of certain like revolution that was happening during 1950s, they went to India and then they have to let go of their domestic workers in Konkiman. And these domestic workers joined uh, in sex work in sex industry and they started returning back to the community for recruitment. So sex work was a very, very normalized thing in the community for like 50, 40, 50 years. People went direct. People went to do sex work till 1990s. The debate of anti-trafficking was uh, the international debate of anti-trafficking was uh, was basically uh, very, very hegemonic. Like every discussion which has to do something with gender, you know, people were talking about human trafficking and all. And there were two groups, as I've already mentioned, two feminist groups who were fighting all the time. Now, as a result of that, people did uh, quite a lot of coalition in Nepal as well. And one feminist group is in a sex worker bath, other feminist group is in that, you know, we need to talk about their rights and representation. Now, this picked up during 1996 when there was this uh, uh, raid that happened in Mumbai, Pradal, and they say that quite a lot of like 250 women were from, more or less, were from Nepal. 
and Nepal government refused to take these women back because some people died during the uh, uh, raid process and a uh, few of them were like HIV positive. So quite a lot of discourse came into being and Nepal government said that no, we'll not you know, uh, rescue these women. Uh, so, but but so many anti-trafficking organizations helped that you know uh, um, process, and quite a lot of organizations went against the state to bring uh, Nepalese women back from India to Nepal. Now, at that particular time, you know, when all these things were unfolding in community, people made a youth club, you know, and, uh, during those days, and they stopped. They tried to stop all sex workers from returning back to uh, sex work uh, in India. So whoever was coming, they were not allowed to leave. People were people were working as a people were doing moral policing in uh, in that community. And once that stopped, yeah, you know, all of a sudden uh, people were scared of HIV AIDS. So quite a lot of people died, and people started feeling, you know, super people were super scared. And as of that reason, people say that nobody goes to sex work anymore because there is a stigma attached to that. Now, however, later people told me that, you know, maybe they have fooled you because people still go for sex work, but I mean, nobody knows who goes and when. So clearly they, they were using silence as a tool to subvert, you know, uh, any, uh, you know, any, any form of empirical finding which could create stigma, reinforce the stigma. Oops. Now, um, the uh, and then you know when I try to understand uh, various social spaces like you know household villages and all, we uh, I, I realize that you know the way trafficking um, that way discourse of trafficking operates in this space is very interesting, and people the way people uh, try to subvert or try to challenge this discourse which I'll talk about in a bit is also very interesting. However. Uh, when you you know like shift your understanding from immigration regime or labor regime to the community, you will see that you know there are so many uh, borders which are being produced, which not only extends the understanding of borders, uh, but also uh, speaks a lot to critical and anti-trafficking uh, studies as well. So these are the sites where you know community encounter people on the move encounter borders. Household, villages, government offices, national offices, state borders, of course, India Nepal border, immigration detention, geographers understand the carceral borders, uh, and of course, airports and cities as well. Uh, so, everywhere people move, uh, people encountered certain agents of trafficking. Uh, and there were so many different practices that is being used in Nepal to stop people from being trafficked. So this preemptive notion of protection, protecting people, that has created a lot of borders, uh, like awareness generation, um, production of fear and rumor, you know, cognitive broadening process and everything. Now, on the basis of that, uh, I realized that people, historically, people are trying to escape uh, the whole discourse of trafficking and most of the manifestation of trafficking. Now, this is something which is very important because trafficking is a subject of labor exploitation. Now, people there, they, of course, you know, they are working in exploitative, like, you know, labor relations all over the world, but they have their own rationale of why they want to work over there and people have, uh, pe people, people, pe in order to go to those, uh, uh, you know, labor relations, they have to uh, subvert or escape quite a lot of borders that they encounter. Uh, for example, if you can see here, uh, like details of examples where people uh, uh, resist or escape borders, uh, especially in the social space. Uh, as you can see, these two examples, uh, people say that uh, whenever they used to come to a village, people were not, you know, allowing to leave the community, especially for sex work. Um, and at this particular time, whenever NGO comes and talk about, you know, anti-trafficking problems with illegal migration, people just perform. They say that, yeah, yeah, great, great. But they go to those labor relations. Now, we do need to understand that in, in this, like, you know, 100 year long debate, clearly we are not listening to the people. We are not able to understand what people actually want. And the thing that happened to me, people were guarding some information. People were using silence to, you know, challenge the whole narrative. When we, I brought all these things to the picture, clearly people were trying to subvert literally 
anything that could produce stigma and borders in the community. But of course, there are like political borders, which is very, very obvious. And many people talk about uh, the, um, uh, the border that they encountered in highways and Indo-Nepal border and airport. And there are so many instances where people support those borders. I mean, something has happened in front of me. There were people who perfectly knew Hindi, but they were not speaking in Hindi uh, just to challenge the immigration officer, which was at the immigration gates. And once the woman left, I talked to immigration officer and he said that I know that these people are going there illegally, but we really cannot do anything about it because they are subjects of Nepal. But then the moment I entered into Delhi airport uh, and then uh, enter inside, went past the immigration gate, I talked to these women and they're like, yeah, 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 I mean, uh, we are going to Sri Lanka and from there we'll change our passport, like, you know, visa and then go to Quebec legally. Now, clearly, this is this form of subversion, which is happening in airport, which is considered one of the most secure places on earth, which speaks a lot about the power of the agency of the power of the people and agency of the people, which I try to bring in this particular uh, research. However, uh, I'm not here, uh, you know, like speaking only against anti-trafficking intervention. I'm trying to talk about, I'm trying to give a much larger picture of the kind of borders that they encounter. And these are uh, in labor relations as well. You know, I mean, I have so many empirical findings which say that people are subverting exploitative labor relations in India, Kuwait, Qatar, Malaysia, whenever they feel exploitation, they subvert it and they do their own stuff. Now, of course, it is making their lives more vulnerable because once you leave a labor relation, especially in Malaysia and Middle East, you will become illegal because you are leaving your passport to the employers. Uh, and, and But they navigate those, those illegal spaces very well and, 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 and they, they, they do their own projects. So this basically gives a sense of centrality of mobility. People are moving no matter what, no matter how state or NGO, non-state or global discourse tries to uh, control their mobility. Now, every time, as we have, we have seen, you know, uh, things started happening historically and over the period of time, uh, you know, Mumbai raid happened and there is a proliferation of trafficking borders in Nepal. But people keep on subverting it, which means that uh, the whole discourse of trafficking is reacting against the mobility. Now, what I'm doing is I'm here changing the place of trafficking, you know, the power and placing it secondary to the mobility of people. And that is something which is very important to notice here because this changes the whole worldview of migration, borders, and trafficking as well. You know? Yeah, when you give centrality to the human mobility or you know, mobility practices of uh, community members. Now, I'll not go through it, but what I'm saying is uh, this particular change of mobility, uh, it was you know, this particular change of placement from starting from trafficking as a discourse, which is a political category, political category, which is highly debated to mobility patterns. When you do this kind of shifting, then it would be extremely difficult to fit into one particular, you know, theoretical framework or one particular conceptual framework. And that actually allowed me that this kind of like huge empirical data allowed me to do uh, to think fresh, to conceptualize from ground. And, and I see a pattern that, you know, people are moving, forces of control are trying to capture that particular mobility in the name of protection, in the name of, of fear. However, people are trying to, people are, you know, like finding porosity in the existing bordering uh, you know, practices. So basically there's a new form of control and subversion is coming out from, the, um, from this particular empirical data. And I conceptualize, and on the basis of that, I am conceptualizing trafficking borders. So what I'm saying in this particular article, which is due uh, in political geography, hopefully they will, uh, you know, <laughs> I'll be able to publish it next year. Uh, so basically, uh, what is happening is trafficking is acting as a huge, dis powerful discourse, which is bringing quite a lot of different discourse together and problematizing women's or men's mobility, not in political space, which is known, which is well established in research, but in social spaces as well. Now, this is something which is very, very interesting and which says that there is a, uh, you know, the, the, the critical scholars have not been able to pay uh, detailed attention towards that. 
Now, this is first thing. Second, we saw a gradual proliferation of human trafficking intervention, anti-trafficking intervention in Nepal, which means that people are challenging all the time. There is a need to bring more money, more resource, more intervention to combat trafficking because there is something wrong. There is something which is not working. And what is not working, not because of traffickers, because of the people's power, people's mobility, and they have their own agenda. And on the basis of that, I'm trying to theorize rescaling and re-specialization of trafficking borders, uh, rescaling and re-specialization of border, which is which uh, people like Andrew Burge and Lord Martin consider as the new thing in border critical border studies as well. Now, uh, of course, uh, when we are talking about, you know, things are like anti-trafficking, the bordering practices are never like, you know, 100% effective. What I am saying is there is there are certain porosity and I'm trying to theorize uh, the power of people which find and use that porosity for their larger mobility project as a state mobility. So I'll be theorizing how people, how, why uh, people uh, create assemblage of different uh, you know, information and, you know, objects and everything and for resource and all to subvert and escape anti-trafficking border. And this is something which I'm calling as escape mobilities, you know, and these are like, these give moments of autonomy to uh, migrant workers, you know, to basically prospective migrant workers. And when you try to understand it through temporal lenses, you will see that uh, people have their own agendas, which which is unfolding and people are working in exploitative relation, uh, labor relations because they have such a larger agendas, right? I mean, the way we understand exploitative relationship is also very, very bad. So hopefully in next year, I will be writing a paper on exploitation that, you know, the category of exploitation is also very, very fixed. We really do need to understand exploitation from people's perspective and try to understand things through temporal lenses and spatial lenses rather than understanding the exploitation through, you know, like normal usual Marxist lenses and all. So that's how I'm theorizing uh, escape mobilities, which not only feeds into the literature of critical migration studies, especially uh, Nicholas de Genova's work of uh, autonomy of migration and all, but it also talks about uh, a larger, you know, uh, uh, problems which are there, which which is being produced in uh, through discourses like human trafficking and all. Now, the, when, when we bring everything together, we see, I've already mentioned that there is a destination bias that is happening, uh, which, which, which is very, very important to address, especially in the literature of human trafficking, because people say that trafficking, most of the work, uh, most of the, uh, you know, critical work on trafficking has already been done. But I ask this question that if critical work has been done, why nobody is listening to all these critical scholars? why people are still investing a lot on human trafficking related issues, why uh, sustainable development goal 8.7 is critically, no, uncritically bringing trafficking into the discussion without even understanding people's perspective. Now, uh, from my thesis, three things come out uh, directly. One is the notion of trafficking borders, which I'm changing the meaning of human trafficking. That's basically one step towards addressing the destination bias. Second would be escape mobilities because the notion of escape is also very, very uh, destination centric because people think that escape is something which happens in the privileged immigration regime. I think there are no people escape their own state as well. You know, and this feeds into John Scott's notion uh, of you know how people subvert their own nation state as well, and of course I'm trying to uh, re-theorize transit mobile, transit migration as well as through departure avenues, uh, which which was the topic of my uh, this was the you know the topic of my whole dissertation uh, whole PhD thesis the disaster uh, sorry uh, the departure avenue politics of anti-trafficking and immigration control in Nepal. So we, we need to focus more on what is happening in immigration regime. And of course, uh, first, empirical material is very less uh, uh, in uh, anti-trafficking studies. And critical empirical material is basically non-existent. So these, this is one of those research which talks about which empirically 
challenge is the dominant paradigm of human trafficking because majority of the work talks about conceptual issues coming from different ideological position and the moment you see what people are doing you will uh, that that actually would give quite a lot of power to the existing critical literature as well um and 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 one of the most important bit is uh, human geography is yet to properly bring trafficking as a you know uh, human geography as we all know there is very very critical discipline it is yet to fully uh, invest on uh, human uh, trafficking and anti trafficking related issues so hopefully over the like i don't know five six years i will be able to you know properly talk about destination bias because this is just from one particular uh, country i'm talking about at this particular moment however there are so many different countries like in africa in asia in uh, latin america and middle east uh, where so many interesting things are happening people are subverting all these formation of power through different means uh, hopefully uh, this research would spark that debate change the you know the dominant lenses towards global south basically you know the whole lens is towards destination things that is happening in destination doesn't matter is immigration border or labor exploitation but you know i'll be talking about and we'll be talking about you know things that is happening in the middle east so basically in this particular presentation i talk to talk about problematize the notion of human trafficking through uh, borders and i say that the most obvious uh, effect of human trafficking or anti trafficking intervention is border the discourse of trafficking uh, human trafficking produces borders and that is something which is coming directly from the experience of people. now the second thing i talked about that people escape these borders and that's why these borders re specialize and re escape themselves right and the third thing that i'm talking about is creating a framework of critical uh, anti for critical anti trafficking research which could use participatory action research and could do grounded research so i think i'll stop here <laughs> uh, uh thank you so much <laughs>